Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by the following. Indiana University's Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research, presenting Security Matters with tips for improving online security in three minutes or less. And by WTIU members. Thank you. Coming up on Indiana News Desk. I'm sitting there trying to convince myself this is not a freight train. We don't have a tornado over our heads, but it, that's exactly what it was. Three tornadoes hit Indiana this week, crushing homes and downing trees. Widespread flooding followed, creating hazardous conditions. Lots of cars in the, trying to cross flooded roadways. Um, we've been doing evacuations from flooded houses, flooded apartment buildings. Ahead, an expert weighs in on the long-term effects of the recent storms and whether any federal assistance might be available to provide relief to struggling farmers and homeowners. Plus, job seekers who are re-entering the workforce after some time off to take care of young children or to serve in the military face numerous challenges. Nine times out of ten, they're looking for someone younger than I am who they can pay less. <laughs> this week, we start a three-part series looking at the labor market and the obstacles standing in the way of Hoosiers who are trying to get jobs. Those stories plus the latest news headlines from across the state right now on Indiana News Desk. Welcome to Indiana News Desk. I'm Joe Wren. It's been a dangerous and devastating week for Hoosiers as severe weather pounded much of the state. Several communities were hit hard with flooding and wind damage. As Barbara Brozier reports, families are now trying to salvage what they can while state officials work overtime to assess the damage. The sky gets dark and you hear that sound that's enough to immediately make your heart start racing. We heard the freight train sound. And for the people of Prince's Lakes, it came barreling into their neighborhood in the middle of the night. I've been in nice, loud, howling windstorms, but the, the, the speed changes. This was very constant. And it's say, I'm sitting there trying to convince myself, this is not a freight train. We don't have a tornado over our heads, but it, we ended up, that's exactly what it was. An EF0 tornado blew through this neighborhood on Sunday, taking down limbs, ripping off roofs, and sending a tree onto Ray and Lucy McMahon's house. The fire department pounded on the door to see if everybody was all right because our house was completely covered. The tree landed right on the peak of the roof, perhaps the best place for it to fall. We lucked out quite a bit. It could have, if it had been over another couple of feet and was a little bit, uh, uh, freer from its uh, root system, it would have went right through the roof. Some of their neighbors weren't as fortunate. It had enough oomph to pull their pull her um, the roof off of her uh, porch, and yeah. half of it ended up 200 feet away. The tornado in Princess Lakes was one of three that touched down this week in Indiana. An EF0 tornado damaged crops in Warren County and an EF1 touched down in Putnam County. While the storms were detected on the National Weather Service's radars, no sirens were sounded. Thankfully, no one was injured. I just feel blessed. I mean, it could have been so much worse. It wasn't wind, but rain from the same storm system that proved problematic in Mooresville. So much rain came down in such a short period of time, some homes had to be evacuated. Many sustained substantial water damage. Mom said the water was coming up through the registers. So it was actually bubbling up through the bottom of the house. Brian Gunnell's family is trying to sort through all of the debris to determine what, if anything, can be saved. It's a heartbreaking process because this isn't just a home. It's a significant part of his family's history. My mother was born here. Uh, her dad bought this house in 1925. Um, prior to that, his parents rented this house, so it's been in my family for over 100 years. More than a century, washed away in a matter of minutes. It's, uh, I'm sorry. It's been a little tough. She raised all four of us here, and but, you know, it's looking like it's time to move on. 
The ground was saturated, so when another round of storms came through Indiana on Monday night, it made an already bad situation much worse. As Sarah Whitmire reports, high water covered fields and roads and forced homeowners to evacuate. In Brown County Tuesday, water was up to the door of homes. Picnic tables were washed away. Cars were underwater. We've been doing evacuations from flooded houses, flooded apartment buildings. The heavy rain turned ditches and small creeks into raging waters. 37-year-old Travis Watkins got caught up in the fast-moving water trying to cross a small feeder creek to check on his grandma. Rescuers searched through the night and into the day on Tuesday using poles to check the water and the debris on the sides of the creek. Late Tuesday afternoon, they recovered his body. To the east in Columbus, Dwight and Tammy Nicholson watched as the water rose around their home. Oh, it's scary. I can imagine the people that live back there particularly were, were very worried. The Nicholsons were fortunate. Their home didn't get flooded, but many of their neighbors weren't so lucky. The sheriff's department was responding to calls about people that were trapped in their houses. It's been messy um, in different pockets of the state uh, and we're certainly we certainly have people out in the field touching base to to uh, get a handle on those situations. In Portland the downtown area is inaccessible. In Rensselaer in the northern part of the state fields were washed out and as lakes across the state reached record levels the Army Corps of Engineers released water from dams. It's emotionally tiring. Uh, it's certainly hard on crops. It's certainly hard on uh, buildings um, and hard on the spirit of, of people who live in Indiana. The state's Department of Emergency Management is working to get a handle on all the damage. Erickson says they asked FEMA for more time to gather all the damage information. The water may stand for a while and you really have to wait until those waters recede before you can get in there and take a look at buildings and other areas to assess damage. The state will compile all the damage reports it receives and figure out if it makes sense to apply for federal assistance, which might be in the form of low interest loans or grants. There's not a hard set of guidelines, but the more information that we can, um, that we can gather, the better off we are in making that case and evaluating that case. The state will need to explain how concentrated the damage is and show that it's more than the state on its own has the ability to recover from. While we don't have property damage estimates yet, corn and soybean farmers alone are looking at losses in excess of half a billion dollars. And before we change topics, one area we didn't touch on was the effect of flooding on recreational activities. If you visit Lake Monroe or plan to visit the beaches there, DNR officials say not this year. The lake is so high that officials say there's no way they'll be able to reopen the beaches before Labor Day. Now, for headlines, we go over to Barbara Brozier, who has the latest on this week's top stories. Thanks, Joe. State Superintendent Glenda Ritz's campaign says the money she's accused of raising illegally for her gubernatorial bid is just a clerical error. Candidates are not allowed to raise money during the legislative session, but Ritz's recent financial report forms show she raised $8,000 in January and February when the legislature was in session. The gubernatorial candidate says she did no fundraising during the blackout period and the finance forms will be corrected. Representative Todd Young is launching his Senate campaign in Sellersburg Saturday, just north of Louisville. The 9th District Congressman announced in a YouTube video last weekend that he is seeking to replace Senator Dan Coats, who is retiring next year. Everything in my life I owe to God, my family, the Naval Academy, and the Marine Corps. And the best way I can think of to give back is to ensure that every Hoosier family enjoys a better future. That's why I'm running for U.S. Senate. Two other Republicans, former GOP State Chair Eric Holcomb and 3rd District Congressman Marlon Stutzman have already joined the race. One Democrat, former 9th District Congressman Baron Hill, is seeking the Democratic nomination. Representative Young's decision leaves his seat in Congress open. Republican State Senator Aaron Houchin and Attorney General Greg Zeller are running for that seat. 
Indiana finished the 2015 fiscal year with a $210 million surplus. The governor required agencies to send $133 million back to the state earlier this year because of low tax collections. Even if he hadn't done so, the state still would have had a surplus. Pence defends the decision, saying it puts the state in a strong fiscal position. But House Democrats say the governor is hoarding money at the expense of funding critical needs. Indiana Senator Dan Coats says he hasn't decided whether he will vote later this year to lift sanctions from Iran as part of the nuclear deal the Obama administration announced this week. The deal between Iran and a group of nations led by the U.S. aims to keep Iran from developing nuclear capabilities by allowing the International Atomic Energy Agency access to Iran's energy facilities. Senator Coates says he's profoundly skeptical of the agreement. He recalls when President Clinton made a similar deal with North Korea, but that country obtained nuclear weapons anyway. I don't want to see that same thing happen uh, to Iran. And so the words of the president uh, don't reassure me uh, in saying, trust me, everything's going to be good. And by the way, I'm going to veto it if you don't agree. Uh, that is not leadership. Others say while the deal might not be perfect, it's better than no deal at all. If you do not have a deal, you have no constraints or at least very limited constraints on Iran's pathway to a nuclear bomb. A vote in Congress on the agreement is expected in September, but President Obama has promised to veto the measure if Congress doesn't allow him to lift existing sanctions on Iran. The ACLU is taking the state to court on behalf of a child caseworker who says she's handling way too many cases, putting children's lives at risk because the agency won't hire enough people. Indiana law mandates Department of Child Services caseworkers don't supervise more than 17 children at a time, but some case managers are overseeing more than 40. The General Assembly is giving the DCS $15 million to hire 100 more case managers. But ACLU legal director Ken Falk says that's not enough. Uh, I am not sure if DCS has the ability to achieve these standards without more support from the legislature. I suspect the legislature must step in. But it's a legislator's standard, and, and the state of Indiana is on the line here to protect children. The DCS says it cannot comment on pending litigation. Indiana schools are running low on teachers. According to the most recent data available from the Indiana Department of Education, the state licensed about 4,500 new teachers during the 2013-2014 school year. In 2010, that number was 5,500. Education experts attribute the decline to low pay, a social stigma surrounding the teaching profession, and specifically in Indiana, newly enacted policies that make teaching a less appealing career path such as tying teacher evaluation to student test scores. Federal data shows enrollments in university teacher preparation programs nationwide have fallen by about 10 percent over the past decade. Cities and counties across the state are considering whether to add electronic cigarettes to their smoking bans. Some already have. Review the proposed changes to Chapter 370. Uh, smoking in public places. The Monroe County Health Department held a meeting this week to consider banning e-cigarettes in public places. The ban would only apply to the county, not Bloomington. Health officials say the public response to the proposal has been mixed. There were many that were opposed to it, but there was also indications that people didn't really know a lot about them. The state legislature declined to take up a bill this year that would have added e-cigarettes to the statewide smoking ban. County fairs are being held across the state, but there's something missing. As Alexander McCall reports, an outbreak of avian flu in states across the Midwest earlier this year prompted the Indiana Board of Animal Health to issue a ban on poultry shows. The ambiance of the poultry barn at the Vigo County Fair is much quieter without the clucking of hens and the crowing of roosters. While a variety of events and animals fill the fairgrounds, the barn is nearly silent. Exhibitors aren't allowed to display their birds this year because of the threat of transmitting avian flu. So instead of live birds, rows of posters plastered with photos of chickens display each entry. I feel like we don't really have anything to do now in the barn. It's just kind of sitting there. And the posters, they show 
what we did, but you can't tell the quality of the birds. But 4-H youth educator Sarah Miller says the entrants understand why they weren't allowed to bring their birds. It's important to understand that we they're a part of a larger poultry industry, and so they needed to understand that that was in their, their animals' best interest as well, not having their animals here commingled. The Indiana Board of Animal Health could lift its ban on poultry shows by mid-September. The vacant fire station on South Roger Street in Bloomington will soon be home to the Lotus Arts Center. Lotus Board Chair Doug Eibling says he expects to have a better idea of what the center will look like after this year's September World Music Festival. Music performances that coincide with uh, First Fridays and gallery walks or other reasons to draw people into the Bead Arts District. Uh, visual arts uh, displays that uh, where we can open the bay doors and, and invite the community in. The agreement requires the venue be operated as a public art center or the building ownership will revert back to the city. Employees at the Bloomington-based grocer Blooming Foods will vote Sunday on whether to approve the newly formed union's first bargaining agreement with the company. The agreement the co-op announced this week covers wages, benefits, employee breaks, and other workplace policies, although details of the deal will not be released until it gets final approval. It's not an adversarial relationship. We want the co-op to thrive. We want the co-op to you know, be an even better part of the community. And if there's anything we can help with that, that's what, exactly what we're gonna do. And that's why, you know, we've negotiated the agreement that we have. And Blooming Foods Management also called the deal a success, calling the agreement a testament to the passion of the staff and managers. We'll be following that story, Joe, and of course, update people as soon as we get word. Okay, thank you very much, Barbara. And coming up next on Indiana News Desk. Mothers often take breaks from their careers to stay at home with their children, but that decision makes it difficult to get a job later on. We launch a three-part series on the barriers Hoosiers face to re-entering the workforce. Plus, have you seen these photos yet? It's the first time we're seeing Pluto up close, and soon you'll be able to see it from an observatory right here in Indiana. These stories and more next on Indiana News Desk. I can change the world with my own two hands. Make it a better place with my own two hands. I'm gonna make it a brighter place with my own two hands. I'm gonna help the human race with my own two hands. I can comfort you Aha. with my own two hands. With my own, my own two hands. Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. Looking for a new job can be difficult. You have to update your resume, network with friends, and make sure you have the skill set to impress potential employers. Plus, some people have additional hurdles to overcome. Gretchen Frazee has been reporting on what it takes to re-enter the workforce and joins us now to introduce this three-part series. Gretchen, you found that getting a job can really be difficult for mothers. Yes, that's right, Joe, and particularly for mothers who have chosen to leave the workforce to take care of their children. That creates a gap in their resume, they fall behind on the latest technology, and perhaps most importantly, they have to figure out how to balance their family and work. Five years ago, Heather Dumling's family doubled in size when she and her husband adopted two children, Etienne and Sylvie. Now, much of Dumling's days are spent outdoors with her kids, catching crayfish and water bugs in the creek just outside their home in Unionville. Well, I did love what I, I was doing. Um, I wasn't crazy about the company I was doing it for. Um, and more than anything, I was really ready to be a mom. I was ready for that to be the focus um, of my life. And, and, it ha and it's been great. The deal was 
I'm just planning on staying home until they start kindergarten, which will be in August. And now I have to figure out um, what I'm going to be when I grow up. Doomling is 50 years old, and from what she says she hears, that'll make getting a job more difficult. Plus, she'll have to explain the five-year gap in her resume and make it clear that there are times when things will come up with her kids. They'll get sick or there'll be a snow day, and Doomling will have to stay home. We have this traditional mind that, like, you know, um, if you're really serious workers, you are present at work all the time. That doesn't have to be that way. Cha says Doomling's situation isn't rare. A lot of workers have families or loved ones they have to care for, and that applies to fathers too, who are increasingly staying at home to take care of their kids. Women have steadily made up more of the labor force in recent decades. In 1975, fewer than half of all mothers with children under 18 years old were in the labor market. Now that number is 70 percent. Cha says that illustrates the need for employers to be flexible. Some proactive, um, you know, employers are trying to implement those ideas that, um, you know, allow the workers um, to uh, to have some more flexibility uh, in terms of where the work is done and then uh, when the work is done. So that uh, could alleviate some of the pressure and some of the conflicts um, that two or in our families are increasingly uh, experience. Cha suggests employers could even allow new parents to cut back their hours for a few years, for example, then come back full time when their children enter school. And she says there also needs to be changes to laws. The water has been boiling for a while, and uh, White House is now you know, trying to put together this, uh, you know, the flexible flexible work arrangement. Right now, most states, including Indiana, only offer the federal minimum. 12 weeks of unpaid leave. Other states like California are starting to require companies to offer paid leave, and employees are starting to demand more flexibility as well. This economic trend and what the people want and the people need will, uh, could be a driving force in, in some, uh, in, in, you know, hopefully in a near future. But changing stereotypes and laws are likely to take years. In the meantime, mothers could take some advice from Kathy Green, who successfully re-entered the workforce in 2001 after being at home with her kids for seven years. I was incredibly nervous. Um, I didn't know what I could do. A quick look at the photos around Green's house reveals how important family is to her. The best part about being a mom is being a grandma. The Green says she felt like she was a better mother when she was working. She says she was fortunate that a friend she worked with in PTA realized her potential and recommended her for a job. I never equated volunteer work as job skills. I should have. I should have all along because the things that PTA taught me, public speaking, um, publisher, Excel for the budget, all those skill sets translated into the job I eventually got. Now, Green works for Congressman Marlon Stutzman, a job she says she got because of her network of friends. Volunteer in some capacity. If school's not your passion, then maybe something else is that you can meet people who, in turn, can be somebody that can network for you for a job. And Joe, Kathy Green and employment professionals also encourage mothers to go to career service facilities like Work One that offer free resume services and free mock interviews. Okay, thank you very much. And we're looking forward to part two next week. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Gretchen. For the first time in history, we're seeing up close images of Pluto and its series of moons. Greg McCauley from the Link Observatory joins us now. This has been so fascinating to watch. So that, that spacecraft's about the size of a grand piano it and is. traveled three billion miles. How, how is that possible? <laughs> well, it was launched nine and a half years ago, and uh, it was the fastest launch ever in NASA's history. history. As a matter of fact, it was uh, so fast it crossed the moon's orbit in just nine hours. And back uh, during the Apollo days, that was a three-day journey. And so it's, it's just been amazing. What, what just all goes into that, to be able to do something like that? You know, it's incredible. I, I, as we had talked before, it was uh, not only is this flyby of Pluto and its system of moons remarkable, but it's a remarkable piece of human achievement. Uh, they had to, after nine and a half years and 3.2 billion miles of travel, they had to hit a circle about 200 miles in diameter just prior to insertion as they were flying past Pluto in order to get the right altitude and the right angles. 200 miles in diameter after nine and a half years and three billion miles, and they did it. So what's so mysterious about Pluto? What, what are we going to learn from this? We'll learn everything, actually. Pluto is, uh, 
It's kind of the underdog. You know, Pluto was discovered in 1930. It was uh, just different than everything else. It was out beyond the orbit of Neptune and on a highly eccentric uh, inclined orbit. Nobody knew anything about it. We'd never seen the surface of it. Even the Hubble couldn't take pictures because it was so small and so far away. If you can imagine, it's like looking at a golf ball 50 miles away mm. is what it would be like going out in your backyard and trying to find Pluto. And now this is something, though, that you can't see from your backyard. It takes at least a six-inch telescope to be able to see it, and still it would just be a point of light in the sky like a star. Now, how about there at the Link Observatory? We can, and we can, uh, and when it's available and when it's visible in this hemisphere, we'll certainly be, have crowds out there to look at Pluto. It'll still just be a small spot. So where does the spacecraft go now? Well, now that it's flown past Pluto, it's traveling at 31,000 miles an hour. That's nine miles a second, nearly a million miles a day. It's going to fly out into the Kuiper Belt. We're going to retarget and look for some of those Kuiper Belt objects, make that same flyby, and then it's going to leave the Kuiper Belt, eventually go through the Oort cloud and out into inter interstellar space forever. And now you have a few programs coming up at the observatory. We do. On July the 25th, Saturday night, 8 o'clock, at the Mooresville Public Library, we're holding a, uh, an hour-long multimedia program at just about this mission. And then we're shuttling people out to our observatory so they can look at Saturn. And uh, when Pluto is available in the night sky, we'll look at that, too. Thank you very much. Fascinating stuff. Thanks for having me here. That's the end of this program, but our work continues online as we cover the news throughout the week at WTIUnews.org. Have a great weekend. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by the following. Indiana University's Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research, presenting Security Matters with tips for improving online security in three minutes or less. And by WTIU members. Thank you.